everybody, it's Rob, National Fire Radio here with the ever-present and beautiful Jeremy Donch. Rob, I appreciate um, that, man. That's, yeah, uh, you know, on a day like I've had today, um, I really, I'm almost blushing. Thank you. Yeah, nice. Hey, and, and we have our special guest tonight is uh, Brendan Trainer from Gilbert Fire and Rescue. He's a captain out there, but also the author of The Fire Interview, The Storyteller Method. Uh, Brendan, thank you so much for coming on. You sent us out the book. I, I blew through this thing in like a day and a half. And wow, what a, what a, great, um, what a great tool for anybody that's out there that's looking to, to get on the job. By all means, you should be seeking out this, this book. So Brendan, thank you so much. And uh, let's begin. Where, where, where are you from? And we'll start getting your, hit, your, your story down and like yeah. how people know who you are and, and how we got there. Yeah, so right now, probably nobody knows who I am, but <laughs> unless you live in Arizona. Uh, so I'm from Arizona originally. I pretty much grew up in Gilbert, which is where I work now as a, as a, as a firefighter. And uh, grew up here in Arizona. My dad worked for Phoenix Fire for 37 years. Uh, he's retired now and worked, did the private AMBO thing like most people do for a few years. I worked in the alarm room as a dispatcher and then eventually got uh, picked up. So I started on the ambulance, uh, let's see, probably 15, 16 years ago, 16 years ago. And then, uh, and then got picked up by Gilbert as a firefighter and became a paramedic and a Haztec and a captain and so on and so forth and that's brought me to today awesome. where so so you grew up in this right so you're you're second yeah. generation then you said your father was in phoenix uh, yeah. for 30 uh, 37 years yeah i think i'm actually fourth generation i love that uh, my <laughs> grandfather was a fireman back in vermont i think and a volunteer and his father was a volunteer somewhere uh and awesome. then my dad was the first career fireman yeah he did he did 37 in phoenix 37 years is is quite an impressive um career and yeah it's a long run <laughs> hell he, yeah did he uh did he retire off the back step as just a fireman or did he promote yeah he retired as a division chief okay cool. yeah so the exposure, right? Like, were you a, were you a fire, fire family? I mean, did you grow up with this incredible influence from your father? Did he bring the job home? Did he bring you, you know, were you able to go see him at work? I mean, paint the picture yeah. a little bit as to the background of your, of your upbringing, because I know how passionate you are and, and we're going to get into all that with the book and why you created this book and which ultimately is promoting the betterment of the of your brothers and sisters and which promotes a better department and and uh you know and company and so on but you know talk about the upbringing a little bit the influences you have because i think that has to do with where you are today no yeah for sure so it definitely was a fire family i remember um going on ride-alongs with phoenix fire and now things are a little stricter these days but back in the day you didn't have to be 18 and sign a bunch of waivers and whatnot you know, you just took your kid to work um, back then. And, uh, and so I remember getting up early in the morning, still dark outside, putting on my little Phoenix fire uniform that my dad had made for me. I was, you know, maybe 10 years old when I started doing ride alongs and uh, doing 24 hour ride alongs on busy trucks and, you know, in, in downtown Phoenix and uh, just loved every second of it. I loved going to work uh, with my dad and, and put them on my little uniform and they'd let me take a blood pressure here and there and stuff like that. And, uh, I remember helping out, you know, aim the deck gun on a big fire and they just, they tried to involve me as much as they could. And, yeah. and, uh, and then, yeah, it just grew from there. I remember in sixth grade for show and tell, I did an innovation on a dummy from show and tell in sixth grade. Uh, so the paramedic stuff, the fire stuff. Yeah. I was, I was pretty involved in all of that. And, uh, my dad did a lot of testing for uh, captain and chiefs and recruitment testing and engineers testing. So I was always out there as a teenager pulling hose and helping with testing and all that kind of stuff and, until I was old enough to, to start testing. But yeah, definitely always what I wanted to be and, and just followed in his footsteps. And he was a great mentor and, and a, a built a great reputation for me and my last name coming in. <laughs> 
All right, so your father is quite the influence in your life. And, I, ha you know, the fire service is one of those magical things. I talked about this the other day on something I did. And, um, you know, it was just, uh, you know, people often don't know uh, what they want to do when they grow up. And, uh, and so, you know, it takes, it takes them a while to figure out where they want to be and, and how, to, how to go about their life. And for, for guys like yourself, man, you had that direction from very early on. And so it allows you to focus and narrow in on that. And I, I just, that's why I love knowing where guys get their influence from. And, you know, if it is a, a firefighting family, I mean, I come from a firefighting family, but it wasn't talked about every single day. You know, it wasn't a, right. a firehouse, if you will. Um, it was just part of a part of the family, but wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't dragging me. I wasn't able to ride and do all those things that a lot of guys get to do. So, that influence is huge. And so that obviously then took you into your career. Um, and, uh, and so you, uh, did you volunteer? Do they have volunteer where you are? No, they don't really have a volunteer out here. Um, everybody, they, they do, but it's pretty outer lying outside the, the valley. Um, but everybody in the valley is all full time. Um, so I started on the ambulance at 19 years old, working as an EMT on a on an ambulance, and uh, that's that's where I got started at. And then eventually went and worked uh, in the alarm room, and then and then got picked up by Gilbert as a firefighter. And when you say alarm room, is that like uh, like the dispatch for the city, if you will? Yeah, I worked in Phoenix Alarm, which uh, they dispatch for about 37 cities, um, most of the valley. There's only two dispatch centers in the whole Phoenix metro area, is which right? is Phoenix and Mesa. Yeah, we run kind of a unique system out here. We run what's called automatic aid. Um, so we don't have any borders. We all run into each other's cities. We all train at the same academy. We all operate under the same um, guideline, SOPG, which is called Volume 2. So we all run seamlessly. We're kind of more like a Maricopa County Fire Department. We're kind of like, I don't know how many cities are involved in the automatic aid now. It's probably north of 40 cities. And we all run without borders and uh, kind of as one big fire department. So, so we all so it's GPS navigated then? I mean, it's uh, yep. you know, onboard systems to allow for close to yep. response, that type of thing? Yep. So we all have GPS. And there's a bunch of requirements to be an automatic aid. Like you have to have four people on your truck. You got to have the GPS and the right computers and MCTs and all that. So yeah, whoever's closest, it doesn't matter if we're coming back from training in Phoenix and we go available and we could pop call a chest pain call in Phoenix or a house fire or whatever. And be 50 miles outside of Gilbert. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Whoever the closest, most qualified truck is goes. All right. So Brandon, let's talk about, I, I want to hear real quick. Cause I love, I'm fascinated with dispatch centers. I've never did it. I never, I was never a dispatcher um, yeah. in, a, in a busy dispatch center. Right. I mean, you're kind of a young guy in there. No. How old were you when you were dispatching? Uh, probably 24. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, but I mean, you're in a busy spot. I mean, I'm, I'm Phoenix has got it. I think they got, um, I think they got like 60 to 70 engine companies or like 15 trucks, 20 trucks, something like that. So you're talking a sizable department, right? So yeah, a lot of work to be done. What yeah, was it? Over 2000 firefighters. They're a pretty big department. Yeah. yeah. And, and so what was your time like there? I mean, were you, I mean, when you got, you had such an influence growing up and then you get into, then you, you're, you're seeking out before you can get hired, you're seeking out another job that's related to your passion, right? So when you get that seat and you start directing units, man, what's that like? It was awesome. So <laughs> I, it was it was tough because uh, I was in medic school actually at the time with my private ambulance company, which was PMT, Southwest Ambulance, AMR. They all kind of by each other, but at the time it was PMT. And uh, I was completely done with medic school with the didactic portion. I just hadn't finished my vehiculars. And I get a call from Phoenix Fire says, do you want to come work in the alarm room? which of course paid like twice as much as I was getting paid by the private AMBO. And you get to go and, and be a tactical radio operator for these huge fires and technical rescues and hazmat calls and all this cool stuff. So um, I, it sounds like an easy decision, but I had already paid like five grand out of pocket for medic school. But um, I did, I quit medic school. I, I, I ate the cost of that five G's and I went to the alarm room and I don't regret it at all. Uh, yeah. 
Um, it was an awesome, awesome, and I don't know if this is true for all dispatch centers because, you know, you hear some people who hate dispatch, but I can tell you that the Phoenix Regional Alarm is a well-oiled machine. If you ever get a chance to tour it, um, they, are, they are operating at a very high level, and I think it helped me promote the captain because yeah. I got to run hundreds of tacticals with that headset on. Um, which definitely gave me an advantage when, when we do our captain's testing, a big part of it is running major incidents and, uh, and running tacticals. And, and it wasn't my first rodeo with that headset on. So that helped a lot. Were you doing both um, call taking and dispatching or did you just strictly have to do dispatching? Yeah. So um, Phoenix alarm, you rotate. So you come in, let's say for a, you know, a 10 hour day, you spend a couple hours taking 911 calls and then a couple hours as the tactical radio operator, a couple hours on channel one dispatching units, um, which is actually automated now in Phoenix. Um, and then there's some other positions, incoming service rep, outgoing service rep, but you rotate. So you get to do a little bit of everything every day. Can you just like real quick touch on being a call taker? Because I think it's something that most people don't really get the chance to understand yeah, because yeah. My, my mother uh, retired as, a, as a, a dispatcher. She was actually a supervisor for the shift. Um, and like, I, I would just like, cause I mean, there's, that's such a different world and yeah. we just get the dis receipt of the call and, you know, and, and, and then we're talking to you and, and giving you updates, but like, what's that like in that seat as far as like that phone call and you can hear the fire, you can hear the panic or, you know. Yeah. You know, you know, the funniest part about having that background is, um, I still get mad at our dispatch as a captain, like when your MCT or your call information is not accurate or the address isn't correct, or they're not repeating back what I want them to repeat in my order model or whatever. And I have to remind myself, like um, for, for everybody who's out there on the streets running calls, like imagine that the patients that you interview, whether it's a medical call or you're on a fire or whatever, the reports you're getting, um, and how inaccurate that is. And you're there on scene. Like, so then you imagine what they got over the phone. Sometimes all you get is someone who's screaming hysterically and the best I can do is get their address. Mm -hmm. And then of course the engine or the truck or the ambo is mad like that, that we sent them on this call that was nothing or that the, 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 um, the nature code of it was wrong or whatever. But what they don't understand is that like, it took a lot of steps just to get the address yeah. or they speak yeah. another language or whatever. So I have definitely have a lot more respect in, in, in that, um, in giving my dispatchers a little more grace, uh, because these people like, you think they're panicked when you get there, you should see how they were on the phone with 911. And, uh, or, you know, we always get the, you show up and you're expecting this, this, crazy house fire and you show up and it's just a mister system that looked like smoke and but the call taker said i promise you this roof is on fire yeah I yeah yeah flames coming sure from it is roof. yeah and you get yeah. there and you're like cancel the balance you know this this is nothing so but i i love right because everything you're saying is is so accurate but yet it also is another step in in the foundation of what you've done right because yeah. all these influences, and I'll, we'll hit on it later when we start talking about the book and the influence into the book, but the really cool thing about this is, is I'm sitting here listening to you talk about this, and you're talking about understanding the dispatcher's needs, but even being a call taker and being able to dispatch and manage resources, that's all about promotional level type stuff, right? Where you become you know, the, the leader of your company, right? And then you, you're a, a, a link in the command chain of the department and you have a background that's already paved that way where communication's huge, right? Reading your book tells us all about communication and how to communicate, right? Well, influences come from your dispatching background, right? You talk about resource management. You talk about understanding the size and scope of, of, uh, of incidents and technical incidents and things like that. And you had that exposure early in your career to allow for you to know how to put that to work then as a, as a captain. So let's hop into, so great. I mean, your influences, your father growing up in that family and, and the dispatching, I mean, you were surrounded by it at a young age and, and up through knowing that you wanted to make this your career and then boom, you get hired, right? Yeah. yeah. Got hired, um, went through the Academy. We rerun a 16 week full-time Academy out here. And, uh, how big of a department is Gilbert? 
Uh, we've got uh, 11 stations. Okay. Uh, some single company, some dual company. Um, so, you know, we got a, a couple hundred firefighters. We're not uh, nearly as big as like a Phoenix fire, sure. but we're, we're pretty sizable. Oh, no, sizable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. About, uh, I think we have 11 stations right now. So, and how does, how does the testing uh, work there? I know in the book, it said uh, it's an Arizona, it's a statewide test, except for the major cities, right? Um, no. So All everyone right. is kind of the same. So a lot of cities will partner up. Like for instance, the last test we did, Mesa, Gilbert, and Queen Creek, all three cities partnered together for okay. just, I got just the written portion of the test. But then we all separate out during the interviews. Um, Tempe, Chandler, and Scottsdale often partner as they call it the Tri-City Test. Phoenix usually does it by themselves. Um, so um, every city, but we all basically do the same thing, which is an application period, a written exam, and then most cities do one or two interviews. And then a lot of cities in Arizona also do what's called an internship, which is where you go for three. Some, some places do one Saturday, some do three, some do five. And that's kind of like football tryouts. You, you show up on Saturday and we, we run people through the paces. And that's like the final step before we make job offers so that we get to see them. Because, uh, you know, anybody in an interview can sit there and tell you, that they're calm, cool, and collected, and that they make good decisions under pressure, and they're a great team player. And then you put them out there in the mix of the, get their heart rate up a little bit, get them a little mentally exhausted, a little hypoxic, then all of a sudden it turns out that they're not a good team player and they don't have a good attitude. So that's what the intern, a really quick rundown of what an intern is. But yeah, that's the basic hiring process. I don't know how different it is in New York. I heard, uh, is it true that FDNY doesn't even do interviews anymore? Yeah, I don't think there are interviews anymore. I, I can't, I can't say for sure, but um, I'm sure on the uh, on the entry level, no, I don't believe there's any interviews. It's uh, it's strictly test and physical, and then your uh, yeah. placement on the list plus whatever uh, military points, residency points, uh, and then the list comes out, and then you're just subjected to the number on the list. Yeah, they're the only department I've ever heard of that doesn't interview people. I don't know how they'd be able to with the size yeah. and scope of the amount of people that they could potentially put through. I mean, I don't, I don't know how they'd be able to do that. I'll be, I'll be frank, but um, you know, the the hiring here in the Northeast is, um, you know, it's uh, it's a it's a game. I mean, residency is huge. Um, you have to uh, you have to dedicate yourself to where you want to work. And then it becomes a full-time job to get hired. Um, you have to move to the city you want to work in typically. Um, Rob, hop in too. I mean, but yeah, so there's in New York state, they have the rule of three on civil service. So like technically I don't think I was ever supposed to be hired in the city of Poughkeepsie. I was a nobody. They didn't know me. Um, and there was like myself and another guy that I went to the Academy with, we were on the list with uh, two other people or three other people. One of them got, one of the people on the list got arrested for child pornography. So he was, he was out, but he wasn't disqualified because his charges hadn't like actually gone right. to trial yet. Another yeah. guy was just obviously lying about his address. Like there's no way his pickup truck with his blue lights was in the neighborhood that he said he lived. <laughs> um, so then it, it came to, and they, they literally like before they could move on to the next group of, of numbers or the next test scores from the hundreds to 95 down to the, 95 to 90s they had to hire two people off of that list and so like so I mean I, I didn't realize it at the time but I could have probably been like yeah I you know I I skin live animals and they would have been like oh that's very nice uh, <laughs> like because they would have been for, like they would have had to pick either the, the the guy with child porn or the guy who was obviously lying about his address yeah so, and that, that that's just like that was a loophole in the law you know it yeah, I, I don't, uh, Rob, that's the craziest freaking story I think I've ever heard you tell. Uh, but on, on another, on like in New Jersey, for say, right, it's a, it's a statewide civil service test. So uh, every department, unless they choose to do their own, but they typically do not, uh, they do a statewide civil service test. So anyone in the state could take the test, but you need to have residency typically in the city you want to work in prior to the test. So that when you register for the test, you have the residency in the city you want to get hired in. If you don't have residency, most of the time, because it's a statewide list, 
if say the city of Patterson is ready to hire, they'll pull a Patterson city list. And so only re only residents will get pulled on their list. And that means that if you haven't moved there and did everything before the test was given, right, you then can, you, you wouldn't qualify. And so if you don't live in a jurisdiction, you just live, say you live in New Jersey, took the civil service test, and there's probably a handful of municipalities across the state that just use a statewide list, it's near impossible to get hired. Everybody pulls a residency list. So we you have the residency list as well. There's departments that'll use that. Yeah. You can, but you can cross file in New York State. So you can, like, if you score like 100 and you want to like go work in Albany or, you know, or Schenectady or something like that, you can, you can then move up there knowing that you have that 100 and you'll either populate on the list before they pull it or the next time around you'll get hired. But, you know, it's. Yeah. Very... So it's kind of unique. So guys, guys have to know uh, really upfront where they want to work and then they have to. Uh, you know, dedicate themselves to getting hired. And it might take, uh, I just had a buddy of mine get hired the other day and he's been living in that city for three years and he wants nothing to do with living there, but he has to play that game. And so yeah. he, and you have to move because they will send investigators out. They will show up at your residence and, and do that background check to make sure that you're there. You do need to produce bills that you're there. They talk to the neighbors they watch your, they watch your apart. So it's legit. I mean, you gotta, you gotta do what it takes to get the job and that's why, yeah. but the job up here is very sought after. I mean, it, it pays well. Uh, the benefits are huge and it's a very good job. And, yeah. uh, and so for up here, uh, you know, for every guy that gets hired, there's probably 10 that didn't, you know? So in, yeah, it's, it's in my awesome. interview. They asked me about my address and who my neighbors were and i didn't really know my neighbors because i didn't really talk to them but i said to them i was like we can go down to my 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 grandmother's house right now like i, I live with my grandmother just bring your appetite because she's going to cook you, you food like you're not going to go in there and not have a meal yeah and they were like all right and like they i mean there was a guy on a job i didn't realize it was down the street so he he was like yeah i see him there all the time he's 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 a volunteer and like you know but it were it, like jeremy said they'll They'll show up. Like yeah. they'll, they'll look into so it. You gotta, so you got to play the game and you got to do it right. I mean, some people circumvent the system, but frankly, the guys that circumvent the system typically circumvent their whole career. And, you know, and, that, and that's really, you know, how it goes. Um, so, but anyway. Yeah, we don't have any residency stuff. And, and at least in Arizona, none, none of the departments I know of, uh, you definitely don't have to be a resident. We've had people fly out to test from all over the country and uh, – that's interesting on the East coast. They, they really want you to be a resident there, huh? A hundred percent. And you know, a lot of it, I know by me, it's, it's um, a lot of these are, um, you know, uh, small to mid sized cities that are struggling and they want to hire from within. Um, they want a representation of their community. Uh, and so they do that. Um, and, and like I said too, the job is there. I mean, you know, like I said, for every guy that gets hired, there's a lot that don't. And so yeah. there's a lot of people vying for those positions. And so you got to be good. You got to play the game and you got to want it. And the guys that want it typically have very good careers. Um, the people that fall into the job, you know, I, I can't speak for them, you know, um, yeah. and so on. But anyway, so, all right. So, and not only that, but you're right, man. I know there's a lot of departments outside of the Northeast. There's no residency. I mean, I was talking to guys out in Cal fire. They have guys fly in for the fire season and then they fly home for like three months. They don't, it's crazy how that works. Yeah. Crazy. Mind numbing to me. Well, I think it kind of leads us into the, to the book here because in order to get, get there, you got, you're going to have to sit down at some point for an interview. Yeah. And that's kind of where, where your story really, I mean, to me, it was kicked off when you explained this. So kind of like how, when were you first approached about somebody like giving help to somebody in this interview process? Yeah. So I think, Generally, at least here, when when you have someone come by the station, either they're doing a ride along or they're somebody's friend or whatever, and they are interested in, in testing for fire, usually the instinct is to grab whoever the newest guy is or gal and say, hey, tell, tell, talk to this person about interviews. Uh, and so it probably just started out like that, just helping people around the station that we came by for ride alongs. And um, and then I had some friends that I wanted to help get hired. Uh, 
and started talking to them about interview stuff. And I had mentors that helped me before. And so, yeah, we started just developing this system. And before you know it, like everybody who's meeting with me is starting to get hired. So then I started to get this reputation starting to build. And then all of a sudden I'm getting phone calls from guys I've never met from other cities. Like, Hey, I was told you're the guy. And I'm like, uh, I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> and so then they would send their person to me and, and yeah, so we had a lot of success in getting people hired. And so that just kind of grew like wildfire until it just became commonplace. Like, yeah, this is the guy you need to go see. Um, and then, it started to, to grow and evolve the, the system that we use, the storyteller method. And that just evolved from a bunch of different systems that I had used and heard of and heard other people's ideas. And, and some of it just developed by working with people. Like we talk in the book about one of my buddies, Tim, who works for Peoria Fire. Uh, he's the guy that played for Michigan State, you know, and right. so the, the whole highlight reel was created because of Tim. And uh, for, for the people who haven't read the book yet, he basically, um, he's got all these really impressive things that he's not telling me because he doesn't think they're important as a firefighter. And so long story short, we make this thing called the highlight reel where I'm like, Tim, you know, what else are you not telling me? You played division one football and you're the captain of the team and so on and so forth. So we kind of developed the, the book and the strategy and the storyteller method over time as I kept meeting with people and being like, okay, how do we overcome this problem? Okay, now how do we overcome this problem? Little things like the water bottle method, you know, like the, that stuff just came about from figuring out how do we solve problems. And then eventually we put together a, a packet to, to give to people. And that was not economically viable <laughs> taking these things to Kinko's and I think it was costing me like 26 bucks with a three ring binder and a packet with over 100 pages and and then so we decided to publish a book and and I really thought it was going to be a local thing that would help the, the people I'm helping and and just be an easy way for me to distribute the book which is what I would call like step one of our interview prep because I, I don't ever start with mock interviews, which we can get into if you want. And yeah, wh why, why don't you? Because I know that a lot of people, even other, like when I was trying to get on the job, there were books that were all about the mock interview and they kind of started right. off on that. So like hit on that a little bit because I think it's, I, I, it was definitely something I noticed right off the bat with the book that was different from other interview books. Yeah, so Here's the example that I usually give. So Rob, are you a paramedic? Uh, I went uh, halfway through medic school and then got hired and I never went back. Okay, perfect. So if I asked you right now to draw up, um, you know, the correct ketamine and succinylcholine to perform a rapid sequence induction, could you do it? No. Why not? Because I don't remember airway from that long ago. I could, right. I could put everything else, but I would not, I wouldn't be able to get the, uh, I wouldn't be able to get the, the drugs drawn up. Yeah. So why would I ask you to do something if I haven't given you any tools to be successful? So right. I could have you perform this RSI on Jeremy, let's say, and it would totally be botched, right? right. Not if I start to flutter, there'd be no paralytic. <laughs> Yeah, so the dosages would be wrong. You might not do the innovation correctly. Everything would be wrong, right? But it's a failure on my part in the person who's supposed to be helping you because I set you up for failure. What would be a better answer is, hey, Rob, I know it's been a while. Why don't me and you go over the correct steps of what it is I'm looking for you to do to correctly perform this and to score all the points you need to pass this airway scenario? And then you you do some homework and you go, okay, I'm going to go and study this, what you gave to me. And then you do some practice runs and you take some baby steps. And then when I feel like you're ready, now we are aside, Jeremy. Sorry, Jeremy. I don't mean to make you the unconscious guy in this scenario. Well, that's fine. That's, that's probably tomorrow night, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but, uh, so, so to compare that to interviews, I never understood why, when you came into a fire station and you said, hey, I'm trying to get hired, do you guys mind if I sit down and do a mock? And of course the answer in 99% of fire stations is, yeah, for sure, you, you know, as long as you brought cookies or something. And so they sit you down and they do a mock. They don't really tell you what they're looking for. They just start asking you questions. 
and you do a 20 or 30 minute mock interview with them. And then they spend about an hour telling you how terrible it was. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe they give you some good feedback and they give you some little pointers like, Hey man, I wouldn't mention this story or I wouldn't cuss in your interview or whatever. They give you a little bit of feedback. And then you come back the next week, maybe with the same crew, maybe with, maybe with a different one. And it's the same thing. You get an hour of feedback. Nobody ever really gives you a system to say, okay, Rob, let me help you organize your thoughts and your personal story into a design system that's designed for you to score points, that's designed for you to not repeat yourself and get rid of the ums and uhs and stop looking for answers on the ceiling and really get all the things they're looking for and stand out and create separation uh, from other candidates. Because as we all know, you probably have the same thing with podcasts. They all start to run together. So with candidates, if I have to interview, you know, last year we interviewed 300 something people, they all start to run together. They all sound the same. So that's another big thing we do is teach you how to create separation. And so that's kind of how it came to be. I guess to get back to your question of why don't I start with mocks um, is because you have to start with understanding the process to be successful in the steps Right. And then from there, they go to doing what we call the homework. So now you understand the five-step method, the storyteller method. Now you're going to do the homework, which is taking your personal information and plugging it into this system. Because this is not a book that says, say this and you'll get hired, right? It, it's plugging your personal story and your life into the system. And that's what you do in the homework phase. And then maybe after you understand the system and you've done the homework, then you're ready for baby steps. You're ready to do a little mini mock. And then towards the end in the polishing phase, that's when you're ready to sit in front of a full crew in the hot seat and do a full blown mock, which is what most people start with. But as we used in our rapid sequence induction example i mean we know they're not going to be good so why are we doing this to them you know this trial by fire right. method <laughs> well and it can also like for the candidate kind of put some um like major major nervousness into them when they're like now they're like oh man i'm horrible at this i'm never gonna yeah. and, and they could be they could be the next best firefighter that 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 we want with us but we you know we're going to mentally destroy them before they even get in the door yeah, we use the helicopter example, I think, in the book instead of because not everyone's going to understand what RSI is, but you would never teach someone to fly a helicopter. The first lesson wouldn't be fly around a little bit and we'll give you some advice the way we do mocks, right? Like you've got to yeah. start with saying, hey, here's a system to fly this helicopter, do the homework, and then let's talk about maybe flying around. So mm -hmm. that's why we don't start with mocks. What so in in doing this, like you said, you've had some success, but like before you kind of said something that really like set a flag up for me. You talked about mentors and how you're kind of giving back. Who who are the mentors for you that helped you along the way? That kind of really they're they're the good soil that this grew out of, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, he still works for us, um, Chief Mike Connor. Uh, at the time, he was a firefighter, and then uh, he promoted up to captain, and now he's a chief. But he's the one who really helped me understand that that there's a system and to, to answering questions, and um, not the exact system that that we have in the book, but pretty close. Basically, what he told me is is you need to tell them your story, and I think we talk about it in the book. I I bought my first house when I was 19, and and I that's chief Connors the one I'm talking about in the book when he's trying to help me understand like, Hey, if you just come in here and tell them that um, you're an EMT and you work on the private Ambo and you CrossFit and blah, 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 you're going to get lost in the mix with the other thousand applicants as just a 19 year old kid who has his EMT. Fantastic. So does everybody else. Tell, tell me what else or your fire one and two or whatever. And, uh, and so that's where he talked about, you know, what, what do you think of a 19 year old kid? Well, they're probably partying and drinking and chasing girls. But what if they tell you it's a 19 year old kid who has three jobs and owns their own house? And you, you know, it instantly changes your perspective. And so um, Chief Connor was trying to teach me at the time, like, you got to tell your story. You can't, there's a big difference between telling your story and listing your resume. 
So I think a lot of people get trapped into listing their resume where they think, you know what they want to hear is that I have fire one and two and I'm an EMT and I have TRT and I'm a hazmat first responder. And you just get into listing your resume. And what you don't realize is they really don't care about any of that, right? That's been handled already in the application phase. And it's not that we're not going to mention those things, but they're the low hanging fruit. They're the things that everybody has. At some point, you've got to move on and create separation. And so that's really what my mentor instilled in me and has made me successful in all the interviews that I've done and the people I've helped is we've got to tell your story. The only difference between you and the people you're interviewing against is your personal story. And that's what I was going to say. I mean, that's what separates you, right? I mean, everything else is checkbox. You know, I'm a fireman. I'm an EMT. I'm this, I'm that. Yeah, that's great. It becomes gray after a while, right? Like you want to be on one side of the spectrum where they where people are going to be remember you when you get up and you walk out of that room, you want that panel to all look at each other and be like, that ah, guy, he works three jobs, bought his own house at 19. His work ethic is good. He's solid. He, you're a standout. You know, I agree a hundred percent because everything else is really, I mean, people are being posed the same questions, right? People are being posed the same scenarios, right? And it's so it's, what separates you? It's truly just your personal story and how you tell it. For yeah, sure. for sure. Good. I know we talked about it a little bit on the phone, um, but like when I, when I, one of the municipalities I interviewed for was uh, Richmond, Virginia. And in that interview, I was offered an opportunity to ask some questions. And I had, and at the, at the time, Richmond was um, operating a Quint system. And there was a couple articles that were written about them. So I, I had a lot of questions being from the Northeast and the traditional engine and truck company. And I kind of started diving into that because just I wanted to know for myself if I was going to come potentially work there, how it worked, you know. And I said, I remember saying to the one one captain in the room, I said, if I'm supposed to be the first dude, Quint, and I'm supposed to stretch a line, but mom and the three kids are hanging from the windows, do we put the ladder up and rescue them? Or do we just stay with like, how does that work, you know? And um like I think it helped me stand out in the end because like at at one point I was just curious you know like it was just I was just an idiot asking questions but I'm like you know how how do you handle this like what you know but um in the end they ended up calling me back because I didn't show up for the (laughs) for the agility test um and I just didn't want the job at that point but you know if there's an opportunity for somebody to ask questions in an interview should they take that opportunity and like what are some questions that they should like be throwing out there or do you not typically see that um you know with what 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 you're dealing with out in out in phoenix yeah so in the phoenix metro area there's not usually an opportunity for questions at the end Mm -hmm. um i haven't seen that a lot i've been helping quite a few people nationwide now um since we started our instagram which is uh at fire interview or at fire underscore interview, I think. But uh, um, yeah, we've been helping people. Actually, we've sold books in three countries now. So now I can say we're helping people all over the world. But (laughs) uh, to get back to your your question, um, it's not very typical that they have questions for you at the end because it's very hard to score that um, because there's so many directions you could take it. Yeah, Um, It's just really subjective to have the candidates ask questions back. But you could see that. And, and so what we have in, in the book, we talk about um, conclusions. So we have a set plan for what we're going to do in our conclusion, which is a three-part conclusion. We're going to thank them. We're going to run through our highlight reel, which you'll understand better if you've read the book. And we're not going to repeat ourselves, but anything we missed from our highlight reel. And then we do what's called the challenge. And so the challenge is basically just telling them um, that you want the job. And you'd be surprised how many people finish their interview and then they just leave. So you have that opportunity either for questions at the end or a lot of people word that as a, do you have a closing statement or just what do you say at the end of your interview, right? And we like the challenges to to say, hey, um, you know, I just don't want to be a a professional firefighter. I want to be a red shirt intern or I want to be a red shirt at the academy. And I want... 
I want the opportunity to prove to you that I'm going to bust my ass and I'm going to do all the things I said in this nice, cozy, air-conditioned room. Just please, please give me that opportunity. I promise I'm not going to let you down, right? So we have that, that passion and inflection to just ask for the next step in the process. So if I was going to ask anything in the interview, I would just beg for the next step. Don't don't tell them that someday you want to be a captain or a lieutenant or, or how your dreams are going to medic school. That's all fine and low hanging fruit. But what I really like to hear is the guy that's just begging for a red shirt. He just wants to go to the Academy and pull hose and prove himself or herself. Um, and then as far as another question you could ask them, if they're like, well, what, you got to ask us one question. My favorite question is what can I do to be a better candidate for your city? You've, you've seen my resume, you've heard me in the interview. What can I do to be a better candidate? What is it that you're looking for? And um, they could surprise you. They could, they could tell you, you know, we're only looking for paramedics this year, or um, we're only looking for people who can run a mile and a half in under 10 minutes, or, you know, who knows what they're gonna tell you. But that's one of my favorite questions because it just shows humility and it shows that you that you, you want to be the best candidate that you can be. So that's probably my favorite question. If you, if you have to ask one is, what could I do to be a better candidate for your city based on what you've heard today? Yeah. Well, I mean, how, how important, I mean, all great, great stuff. I mean, I've done a lot of interviewing and I haven't been the interviewee too often in my life. Um, I tend to do more interviewing. So I'm on your side, right, where you are now, even though as a captain, I mean, if you want to move up the chain, I mean, when you go to promote, right, is there an interview process on your next step, right? There is. There so, is. Yes. So, yep, there it is, right? So, you know, at some point, I'm sure somewhere in my life, I might be interviewed once again. Um, but even, you know, even I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, even outside of the fire service, but, uh, you know, we do these podcasts and, and it's an interview. Uh, it's the back and forth. It's the body language. It's the engagement. It's the confidence. And that's where I wanted to go with this is how important is confidence when you're sitting there as an interviewer um, and you have a, an interviewee come in and say, it's a young kid. I mean, you're, it's, a, it's an entry level firefighting position you're interviewing. I mean, you just said you interviewed 300 people in the last go around. Yeah. I mean, that is as vanilla as it gets. I would say 95% <laughs> of that is vanilla, right? I mean, right. how many, how many, pistachio and, and chocolate chip and coffee did you have? I mean, everybody, it's all, it's all vanilla, right? Unless they're standouts. Say, yeah. I would say probably 70% yeah. of the interviews I do are a complete waste of everybody's time. And then probably 20% of them are pretty good. And yeah. probably 10% of them are outstanding. Yeah. And, and out of that, how important, in that 30%, the 20% that were good and the 10% that were standouts, how yeah. important is confidence in that conversation? It's important. So I think, um, I think composure might be a better okay. word. And so, yeah, go with it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me explain that. Yeah, please. Because the danger you can have with being overly confident. Like if I came into an interview or like Rob's interview where he comes in and he's like, well, explain to me why you guys are running quints. Is this a, is this a, uh, for economical purposes or are you doing what's best right. for your people? Right. I get it. Like, like that's a overly confident question to 100%. ask. Right? So, um, so the danger with candidates who are overly confident is it can start to come across as cocky and, I'm, and not to compare that to Rob's story. Cause I, I think it was an honest question, but if you have people come in and they're basically in their interview, they're like, listen, I am the most badass candidate you guys are going to see. Okay. I'm the highest educated. I'm the most physically fit and I'm probably going to be your boss someday. Right. So that person is really, really confident, but no, they're, no, they're, they're obnoxious, right? Like there's a difference, right? Like, you know, they, there's the I fine mean, line. And where I, and I, I agree with you hundred percent because what, what it can do, right. Where you gave the, uh, the imagery before and the example of the red shirt, right. That you just really want somebody that doesn't care to be, they want to be a ditch digger, right. They want to be a hose puller at first. And, and that's how they're going to, you know, earn their worth. I mean, I get that. You don't want the guy that comes in 
and is overly confident and cocky and obnoxious to the point that he turns people off when they when the guy leaves the room the panel looks at themselves and goes we're not hiring this guy because he's going to he's going to be the know it all that's going to be telling everybody how to do it and he doesn't know jack shit right so yeah. like i get that 100% i'm just talking about confidence and i i like your word better composure oh, talk about yeah. that yeah yeah, so I totally knew where you were going, and that's yeah. why I threw the composure out because I do think that composure is very important. And that's where you talk about that fine line between um, cocky and confident or right. composed and, and cocky, right? <clears throat> so in your interview, like, I, I, want, I don't need you to be overly confident or cocky, but what I do like to see is people who are very composed, and what that shows me is that when we're on an emergency incident, whether it's a medical call or a fire call or hazmat or a technical rescue, whatever, is that in high stress environments, you're going to be calm, cool, and collected and be able to communicate with exactly. your team and make good decisions. Yep. And if you can't do that here in this beautiful air conditioned room with no, no real stressors, no real danger, it's difficult for me to assume that you're going to be able to do that in real life. And we know everybody gets nervous, right? I get nervous for interviews. Um, and, and so we have a lot of ways to tackle that, which we go over in the book. We have things like the water bottle trick and change the question and break glass in case of emergency. And we have all these different things and, and probably the water bottle one's one of our most popular ones, but uh, we have ways to try to help you, with your composure, because we know that you're going to get nervous in your interview, no matter how much you've prepared. But, but to answer your original question, yeah, I, I think for me, it's very important that people yeah. are, are, are composed and, and it, it shows preparation too. Like, did you really prepare for this interview or are you just shooting from the hip? And I can tell I've done enough interviews. I can tell if you prepared or not. Could only imagine what you're thinking of us right now. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> You guys are awesome. No. No. I can only imagine. He's get, Rob, he's going to get done with his interview and get off and be like, these guys, these guys were horrible. I wouldn't hire them. Uh, I was so excited when you guys reached back out to me because you, you got such a great podcast and a great following. I, I couldn't well, have been happier you. to come out here. Yeah. No, very cool, man. I mean, you know, and, and I, it's great because as we go, like you're – I read a lot of this um, – several weeks back well originally we were supposed to do this podcast like a month ago and then i i had uh rob and i both had something come up and so we had to obviously push it out 20 20 plus inches of snow come up that's what yeah. happened yeah. i had to dig out from it like jeez yeah i had to shovel a bunch of sunshine off my truck this morning it was real pain yeah i, I could only imagine you poor <laughs> poor thing you look <laughs> you look actually pretty weak from doing that like it really took a lot out of you <laughs> But I, I, where I was going with this was very simply, um, this book, it's an easy read. And you, the, you have such a, an incredible quality about yourself of how you're able to um, convey the message, right? And I, I think, you know, we didn't even get into the career, right? We talked about your dispatching and your, your family, you know, background and so on. And, and then coming up through the fire, you get hired and you go through the process yourself and, and then you find uh, through all your influences that it, it gets you on the right track to help other guys and girls in your department. And then the word spreads and so on. And so I guess my, my question is um, in regards to that is you took all this, you put it all together and you packaged it up and, and you have helped so many people, I'm sure, whether it's entry level it's, uh, you know, I don't know if you're on lieutenants or sergeants, whatever, captain, right? And then up the rank. But this book is not um, the fire interview, the storyteller method. This, this methodology that you put in print is not just for one single use interview. This is for any level interview, right? Because it's, it's simple. It's matter of fact. And I mean that in the best way, because it's, a, it's an easy interpretation of what is required of you on, on the simplest forms, right? You know, some, sometimes we overlook and overthink, or a lot of times most people yeah. overlook and overthink everything. And, um, and when I talked about confidence and, and you just discussed composure, those are simple things that we take for granted. And some people are more confident than others. 
um, inherently, right? I mean, there's a lot of skills here that you talk about. You talk about that water bottle method. Like what a simple method and, you know, not to take away from the book because we want people to certainly to purchase the book, but it's a simple pause moment, right? In the interview. I mean, you, you keep referring to it. So I just want to hit yeah. on it. But yeah. from what I remember from the, the water bottle trick was typically a water bottle is, is, uh, is on the table for you during the interview or you could bring your own, if you will. And instead of looking up at the ceiling or looking at the floor when you need a second to regroup, gain your composure or formulate your answer, you take that sip of water or you, you know, and so on. And it gives you that extra, you know, I'm hitting it right. Right. Brendan. I mean, that's, that's really what that is. And it's, it's those little hacks, but you've done so much with this book. What does that feel like, man? I mean, you, you really have created a lot of um, influence in how people's careers have progressed because of the fact that you cared enough to take what you knew and your experiences and put them in print and help out others. That's, that's wild, man. Like I, yeah. you have to sit back, right. Every once in a while and go like, Oh, this is crazy. Like, you know, yeah. that you're having an influence. I mean, right. How, how many, how many badges do you have that you can say, like, not that they're your badges or the, the right. candidates, but like you're, you're attached to how many firefighters who've gotten on the job? Yeah, I don't know, a lot. <laughs> and, uh, it feels good, you know, um, uh, the touch on the water bottle method. You yeah. guys probably saw it on our IGTV on Instagram, but it I think it is in the book also. But yeah, um, yeah it's just a way to reset your brain when you when you get caught on a question. And you, everybody vapor locks from time to time and you, you forgot your train of thought. And it just explains a, a good way to get back. And generally I find that people are between steps, right? They've either just finished step one or step three or whatever. And, and so that's what I tell them. And when we're practicing, I say, Hey, take a drink of your water. Think about what step you're on. And it literally takes them three seconds and they're back in action, um, which is way more comfortable than what we call looking for answers on the ceiling. But um, to get back to your, your, your question, um, I don't know how many how many people we've we've helped. Uh, I I wish I had a number that'd be awesome, but um, it feels really good. We we thought this was going to be like a local thing, like a way for me to save money on on printing, and I would just keep helping people out of my my fire station and 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 help our local people with promotional stuff and sure. And that would be it. And then it grew like wildfire. And I got an email from Amazon that said your book's number one on Amazon. And, and then it started selling in other countries. And then we started talking on national fire radio and I'm like, this is out of control. Um, and we have a thing on our Instagram, which I'm not good at social media, as you can tell if you've been on my social media, but uh, my wife is trying to teach me to be better, but good. we have a success stories thing. And, and those are my favorite when somebody DMs me and says, Hey cap, um, I just wanted to let you know, I just got picked up by uh, Miami date or wherever in the world they are. I just mm -hmm. got, I've been testing. A lot of them say something like I've been testing for years. I read your book. I did the homework. I just got picked up last month. I wanted to say thank you. I love and that. We just published awesome. the book in, uh, September. So it's only been out now for um, four or five no. months now, something like that. Let's take a minute and talk about the book because it was something that I asked you. I was like, oh man, I was just like really smart that you did this. And you're like, that's just the formatting of the book, but it actually helps out because as I was reading the book, I was taking notes in the, in the columns and yeah. it's something that you actually want though. Like you want the book to be a workbook, not just something that sits on a shelf and is all pristine. And yeah. should be covered in notes like that one there on yeah. Jeremy's screen. And I, and I think that's awesome because like, and, and that's, if there's, if there's one thing I want to get out to anybody who's going to buy this book and please do and utilize it to help you with the interview process for your career, do the homework, write in the book and keep the notes because it's going to like, for me, I'm that type of learner where I'm writing stuff down and it, it just helps my, my brain remember it a little bit more, but I think that was an awesome, uh, awesome thing for the book to, to have. And it's, except if anybody's going out there, buy it, use it yeah. as the workbook and, and take notes in those columns. I mean, it's a, it's a hundred pages, you know, just over a hundred pages. Yep. It's uh, it's wider margins, like Rob said. So this is, this is a book that you could literally, literally read in one setting. Right. And then, and then have the ability to make your notes 
and to formulate a plan right in that book and you can tag it, you know, mark it up and so on. It is truly a workbook. And, and I did, we took some notes in here. My wife actually read um, the book cover to cover as well um, because she loves, she, she loves to read. And she was like, well, I know you're not going to read. I'm not a big reader, so I don't want you to be insulted, but I did read. I, I, I did go through, I read, I read a bunch of it. I really did. And I, I digested some of it. I read some more today to really just kind of get the, the key points down and so on. I'm yeah. not a huge reader. I just, I have, I have tons of books. Well, actually I have bookshelves behind me. They're empty right now only <laughs> because this is a new, this is a new off home office. So I'm, yeah. I'm putting it all together still. So I don't even have my books up yet, but yeah, I'm um, hoping to get an audio version out there at some yeah. point that you can listen to. Yeah. Um, we just published, so we, we haven't gotten to the audiobook version yet, but a lot of people have been asking me that, and um, I, I need to get an audiobook version, because I'm the same way. I don't read hardly at all, but I listen to a lot of books um, yep. when I'm doing yard work and whatnot. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it's the just to touch on the, the length of the book and how that came to be, I asked my wife, I was like, man, I don't know. I, I think it's 124 pages, including the homework and the notes. Right, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I was like, it's, it's really short. And, and, and basically I typed what you need to know. And I could, I could have made it 300 pages and added a bunch of fluff in there. And I, I think of it like, like medic school or EMT school or, or whatever school, any pick any class you've ever been to, like you really need to, there's so much stuff that you don't really need to know, but for some reason they feel like the class is more thorough if they include all this crap that I don't really need to know. Uh, like learning the the blood clotting factors or all 12 cranial nerves. I've never been on a call and been like, good thing I know how many bones are in the body. That really came in handy on this med call. Yeah. Uh, so, so we thought, let's just make the book what it needs to be to make people successful. And people have said the same thing about the what we call the workbook, which is really just a couple pages in the back of the book. And uh, that's not so that you get feel like you got ripped off. It's because an effective workbook when you're talking about doing an interview needs to be something that you can recall easily. So if you're filling out a hundred page workbook, what are the chances that you're actually going to be able to recall that information right. on the spot? So it's the book and the workbook and all of it is simple by design so that you can pull it uh, off the top of your head in the middle of your interview and be successful. So I kind of just got rid of all that extra, uh, extra fluff, if you will. And just, it gets right from page one. We, we get right, right down to brass tacks, right, right out of the gates. And um, yeah. even people that aren't testing for fire, we, I've had people tell me that they got into a uh, AT stills med school. Using so I was going to, I was going to hit on that, Brandon, because uh, this is, this is, doesn't just have to pertain to the fire service. I mean, the methodology, this this storyteller method, as you title it, um, has its place everywhere. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I think about from my, and again, it's an easy read. It's not overwhelming. There's the, there's plenty of information, but it's broken down in a, in a very easy to understand way that, I mean, even for uh, high school kids, um, yeah. you know, yeah. that they could digest this in, in a couple nights, give it a read. And they can really get some incredible value out of it where they're interviewing for a job or college, even, yeah. even what? The college, you know? Everything. Well, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Moving off, going to college and then their first yep. job. And, and not only that, but, you know, the other value you bring from this too is it's life is an interview, right? I mean, this podcast is an interview. Yeah. Life is an interview, right? I mean, all of it, anywhere you go, you have to engage people and there's, the 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 tips of the storyteller method and that's what i thought about today when i was when i was thumbing through this and reading and and making some notes was this is really more of a, a life uh, a lesson on life interview right i mean just yeah. life in general you're always in an interview seat whether you're doing the interviewing or you're on the other end of being interviewed Right. And that's as simple as when you go to the store and you ask somebody for something, there's a back and forth and there's, there's yeah. a way you carry yourself. It's the same thing when you're approach a, a woman at a bar and you want to introduce yourself yeah. to her. Right. Yeah. And like it's, it's all of that. And your book very much paints a very easy to understand picture 
of how to have these interactions. And I, yeah. I just, I value that. I think it's great. I, uh, Brennan, is there a second book coming out called uh, the, uh, the Fire Interview, How to Conduct the Interview? Because I think <laughs> that, like, so having, having sat on some interviews before, like, I, after I went through Montgomery's process, I saw, like, that there's a structure and yeah. everything that they were doing was kind of like taking a point and grading something as we came through. Yeah. And um, like, I think there's a lot of, cause there's a lot of places like my job is very small. All right, like we're at our full staffing. I think we're 20 or 22 now um, personnel. And it's usually a couple commissioners, maybe a Lieutenant and the, and the captain or the chief. And that's, and, and it's like, hey, come up with some interview questions. Yeah. So you can have like, you know, one guy who's just like, Oh, you got a ball and a bat, and one's five cents and one's ten cents. How much does this cost? And it's a, it's this riddle, and it's like, and then there's somebody else who like, you know, is like, <laughs> where I, do you come up with this crap? It's unbelievable. It's it called real life, Jeremy. Get at me. Somebody asked you that. I, I've I've been in the interviews where somebody's asked about the lily pad and the lily pond, and it and it doubles in size every fifty, you know, every every time or whatever. How long does it take to pond? They get covered in lily pads. I had the ball in the back question when I was getting interviewed for lieutenant. And like, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't I, look Brandon shaking his head. I'm, I'm just, just, I don't even know what to say to this. But, but Brendan, it's, it's a serious because I like, agree with you, Rob, that there are people out there who are conducting interviews and they don't know how, and then they think like, they think their method is great because <laughs> they've never been told, Hey, you shouldn't ask these questions. Like yes. this question is completely subjective and like there's no good way to grade it you know that's a good idea no one has asked me that yet i get a lot of questions about are you going to write another book on promotional interviews um i have not got a book on how to conduct interviews no one's asked me that yet um please do it you don't need a like, idea and, and, and i mean national fire radio will always accept a royalty if you 100 <laughs> percent yeah, um, we even, no, we even just, have the guy that will do the audio book for you. Rob sent yeah. me a message on the side here, so we'll, we'll talk about yeah. that too. If I was to give somebody just a quick piece of advice, if yes. you're trying to conduct interviews, like just a list, just off the top of my head, because I've spent about five seconds thinking about it, um, the, that, that question, but uh, uh, is what, what is it that you're looking for in a firefighter? What are the character traits you're looking for? Because you can train just about anybody to put on turnouts and pull hose but you can't train them to be a good human being. So what are the character traits you're looking for? And then the second part when you're coming up with the questions is make it easy for your candidate. Don't make a big paragraph long showing off what a great question writer you are. If, if you want to hear um, if they're a good team player, say, Rob, the next question is, are you a good team player? And give us an example from your past of teamwork. You know what I mean? Like if, instead of making it this big complicated, tell me about the lily pad and the pond and that's supposed to tell me some other psychological blah, blah, blah. So think about what you want from a candidate and then make the questions easy for the candidates to be successful. That's, that's awesome, yeah. So you now know what you will be doing for the next six months. <laughs> I'm going to get a hold of you for the audio book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I will tell you though, um, you know, this is, this has been really great. Um, you know, and I, I sit here and I'm always, uh, I'm a guy that can walk into really any situation and kind of uh, be able to um, handle it. You know, um, I interview well, I, I communicate, I think I communicate well. Uh, maybe I come off cocky at times, I'm, I'm told, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just who I am. Right. And I, and then I, sometimes I talk to Rob, like we'll do interviews and like tonight after we're done and you know, you sign off, Rob and I usually stay on for a few minutes and we talk about the interview and you know, how to go, what did we like, what we didn't like, you know, all that stuff. And then, and then I always come back to this thing where, I think I need to do a better job at my interviewing skills. And I think that sometimes I, uh, I either talk too much or I don't listen enough or what have you. And uh, hang on one second. Okay. Uh, so whatchamacallit. So um, 
my wife just peeked in. We got a reported fire right now. So I'm going to cut out in just a few minutes here. And, and uh, Rob can cut out and finish up with you. But uh, whatchamacallit. Um, but anyway, the life of a volunteer fireman. Uh, but anyway, where I was going with this was like, I talk too much. Is it bad? Do we need to slow it down? People with all these different character traits that sometimes people are weak interviewers and sometimes people think they're too confident and overbearing. And so it's finding that middle ground, right? I mean, so many different people have so many different ways of handling themselves and so on. And so for you sitting on that panel and you don't know what you're going to get, right? That guy sits down in that chair and you, you just don't know what you're going to get, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> the, the way we run interviews kind of out here on the West coast is, it's very um, strict. It's not a back and forth conversation like, like we're having now where it's easy to talk for hours because we're kind of all running off of each other. It's a strict question. So it's, you know, tell me why you want to be a firefighter and you talk for three to five minutes. And as soon as you're done, that's it. There's no follow-up questions. There's no, oh, hey, cool, man. You went to that high school. So did I. Or did you play football? There's none of that. It's just, okay, now question two is, you know, so there's no, uh, there's no back and forth in, in a lot of these fire interviews. And I think that's what people struggle with. And, and that's why we have the chapter, we call it giving mini speeches, because that's really more what it is. It's like, hey, give me a mini speech about leadership. And then the next question is, give me a mini speech about teamwork or conflict resolution or whatever it is. Yeah. But they're not going to give you a lot of that back and forth. They're not going to help you out a lot. And that's where the, you know, the podcast is, it's still an interview, but it's, it's a little bit different because we have that back and forth, but no, I think you guys have been doing a great, a great job. It's a, I think it's a great balance of, of back and forth and, and a lighthearted conversation. And Well, thanks. I, I mean, like I said, we, we always wanted to make sure we add value. I know Jeremy worries about it sometimes, but like, I don't really think he ever talks too much, which is, you know, <laughs> ironic. But, uh, I don't think he talks too much. <laughs> yeah, no, he's fine. He, he he does a really good job with it, you know. Yeah. But I think it also kind of like one of the things that I think we kind of bridge a lot too is like his business, you know, from what he does. He, he's he. I mean, he. T it's it's fun. I enjoy when we're um, on those car rides and he's telling me about being the youngest person in, in his game because just with his work, he's he's one of the younger people. So it's kind of. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of cool, but no, I mean, like, I, I think this has been great. And like I said, I, I appreciate, I thank you for sending me a book because yeah. hopefully, uh, you know, the next time I have to interview, I'll do a hell of a lot better, <laughs> even in my experience in the fire service. Yeah. I think I've been in it for 16 and a half years now. And yeah. but like, it goes to show you can always, uh, always learn as well. So. Yeah. And there's a lot of people out there that are um, asking me about promotional interviews. Hey, I'm, I'm testing for Lieutenant or captain or, or whatever. And, and will this book still help me? And so the answer is yes, but there are a couple of things you need to change. And so I would encourage people to go to our Instagram because we have a whole list of IGTV videos where I go into stuff in more depth, but for promotional interviews, like um, for instance, on step three, which is related to the position you're applying for, you're going to need to change that to as a lieutenant or as a captain or whatever right. and relate it to that promotional position. Mm -hmm. And in my IGTV video, I get into a lot more depth on that. And the same thing with your mental file cabinet, which is, a, you know, the stories that we associate with certain core concepts like conflict resolution and uh, customer service and teamwork. That's what we call our mental file cabinet. Um, obviously, if you're testing to be a lieutenant or a captain or a chief, your file cabinet's going to look a little bit different. You might also have to add in there more about leadership, um, supportive action, disciplinary action, things that a recruit firefighter probably doesn't need to worry about a question about disciplinary action, you know, because uh, they're, they're not a manager. But so those right. are just a couple little things um, to help those of you who are listening who are thinking, well, I, I'm already a firefighter, and, and so what, how can I use this to help promote? And uh, like I said, definitely go, go to our Instagram because we, we post a lot of stuff on there and, and, and we post a lot of stories where, where you can just ask us questions and then we'll go into a nice in-depth 10 minute answer on, on your specific question. Um, yeah. And then I'd like to think we post a lot of funny memes too. 
Yes, yes. And like, so even even I saw you, you were doing some uh, some medic stuff the other day too, which is always good. So yeah, that that actually went was uh, that's the most watched video we've posted so far. So I guess I'll have to do more medic stuff. <laughs> well, Brendan, I I thank you a lot for for coming on and, and talking about the book and talking about your and, and trusting us with your story tonight because, like I said, this is uh this has been a pretty good thing. So, Jeremy, do you have anything else to uh, to add in there? Hold on. All right. So it sounds like it's unfounded. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep rocking here. I'm not running out of here. All right. So I I want to say this. I I was listening. I apologize. We we got a reported fire right now. So I'm just listening to what's going on. Um, basically, Brennan, I, I think what you've brought to the table is huge. Um, like everything in the fire service, right? We want to do it for the greater good and in the bigger picture. And what you guys have done, you and, 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 uh, and the, the few through your career that have helped you craft and, and put together this book with the support of your wife and so on. Um, you know, you're, you're paying it forward, man. I mean, you know, you, you're putting out a tremendous amount of, uh, personal experience through this book and through the methodology of the storyteller method, you put all that together based on your own personal experience. You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to start with that grassroot of, of, you know, printing out $26 worth of, you know, Kinko's booklets for guys around the kitchen table. And then next thing you know, the engine from across town shows up because a couple more guys want to learn. And then a couple, like all of that, you, you did that not for yourself. You did it to help, make the job better to better individual careers and to, and to make the job better. And, and for that, I, I, that can't go um, without being said. And so um, kudos to you for doing that. Um, it's all in the, the, the best spirit of what the fire service is all about. I think that you're going to make a, an incredible impact with this, uh, with your methodology. And uh, I just want to thank you for coming on tonight. Um, it's been great. I do, Rob, we should definitely have to let people know where they can find uh, the book and uh, the channel. So Brendan, where can people find yeah. you? Uh, how do they access this? Um, how are they going to listen to the new podcast you're going to launch when you start doing a podcast <laughs> about success stories with the people all over the country that you've helped? Because yeah. if you go off air, I'm going to pitch you on that idea because I think you need to do that uh, yeah. and so on. But I, you're, the, the impact that you're making and the fact that, uh, you know, people are, are letting you know firsthand that you've made a difference in their career is huge, brother. It's huge. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Where can people find you? Yeah. So um, the main place that we're at, we're, we're on Facebook and everything, but the main, where the main action is at is on Instagram. And we're at fire underscore interview, or just, if you just search fire interview, we'll, we'll pop up there. Um, and, uh, that's where the, all the main stuff is going down is on Instagram. Um, and you can get the book on Amazon. That's the only place you can get it. Just go to Amazon and search for fire interview, uh, the storyteller method. There's a couple other books out there, but just look for the, the Navy blue one that says the storyteller method. Two day um, shipping with Prime. What's that? Two day shipping with Prime, right? Yes. And we're, we sold enough copies that we're available on Prime now or available worldwide. And, uh, yeah, it's been going really good, and and we've been we've been trying to give back, and so we gave away stuff. Uh, we did every, every day up until Christmas. We were giving away stuff on our page and ordering stuff from other fire department companies, and and uh, I appreciate you guys sending me some stuff. I still have the the flag. I can't decide if I'm going to give the flag away. I want. I kind of want to keep it. Keep it. <laughs> keep it, man. We'll send you more. That's that's not even an issue. Like, just tell us what you need. We're happy to. We're happy to oblige you, man. But, um, you know, I, I just, it's awesome. Fire interview, the storyteller method by Captain Brendan Trainer, um, Gilbert, Arizona firefighter, and uh, making a difference in America's fire service, brother. Thank you for sharing your story tonight. Thank you for being here with us and giving us a glimpse into um, all your hard work and the passion that you have for uh, paying it forward. And uh, thanks for being here tonight, pal. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. You guys are awesome. I appreciate you giving me the time. Of course, man. Anytime. You you have a home here. And, uh, you know, we have some ideas. Uh, we have some ideas off air. I'll pitch you. So don't go anywhere. We're going to end the <laughs> we're going to end the podcast, but stay on with us for a few minutes. Uh, I got a couple yeah. ideas that I think um, we could do together that would uh, help promote um, the storyteller method and, and what we can offer. So uh, anyway, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thanks.
Rob, take us out. Everybody, this is Rob from National Fire Radio with the beautiful Jeremy Donch and Captain Brendan Trainer of the Fire Interview, the Storyteller Method. Thank you for joining us tonight. Go out there, buy the book, Amazon, two days shipping with Prime. It's going to be there. It's awesome. It's going to help you out. We'll see you guys later. Thank you, Rob.